Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming up here with, and hanging out with me for just a few minutes this morning. I want to ask you a quick question. Have any of you ever heard of the golden rule? You ever heard of that? You've heard of the golden rule? Yes. Do you, can you say the golden rule? Do you know what it is? Okay, can you, there you go. Treat others the way we want to be treated. You know, one thing about, I don't care how old you are, we like people to be nice to us. You're what? Awesome. I don't care if you're four or 45, Chris. I don't care if you're four or 45. We like people to be nice to us, don't we? And the golden rule, as uh, Luke said, is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now, I really don't have the time to explain all that to you, and I would love for maybe your parents or your grandparents to tell you a little bit more about it. But a lot of times, uh, I've seen uh, the golden rule in schools. I've seen it in classrooms. I've even seen it in executive, uh, uh, executives of companies. They'll have it in their office. And it's just a reminder that we need to treat people the way we want to be treated. Luke, I've heard it misquoted. I've actually heard people say that the golden rule says, do unto others before they do unto you. And that's literally not the golden rule at all. But here's the thing. Jesus said the golden rule. And if Jesus says it, we need to be doing it, right? If it's in the Bible, we need to be doing it if Jesus tells us to do it. And this is how Jesus said it. He says, therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. The Bible also tells us to have friends. We must present ourselves as friendly. So always remember, Jesus tells us that no matter what, we're to be nice to people. We are to treat people the way we want to be treated, even if they don't treat us nice. We are still to be nice to them. And that's the hard part. That's the hard part. But there, once again, Jason doesn't say do it. Jesus said do it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love. And God, thank you for being good to us. Thank you for being nice to us, Lord. And Lord, I pray that today you help us be good to you and to be nice to you. But not just you, Lord, but all of our family and all of our friends, that they will see Jesus in our life. Lord, that's our prayer. And we ask it in your name. Amen. Thank you. If you'll go, Miss Rhonda's got something for you there, and then you can ease on back. Thank you for coming up here with me this morning. Will y'all give God a hand for our kids? And with this transition, I invite you please to turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. The screen's cut off just a little bit in front of me and probably behind me, but it's Matthew 5, chap- excuse me, Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. We are continuing our series this morning of our attitude about the Beatitudes. Our attitude about the Beatitudes. And we are picking up exactly where we left off from last Sunday. And we're at verse, num- uh, we're at verse 7 this morning. And uh, I want you to understand... Uh, 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 what is what is getting ready to happen here? And and as I and as I, as I shared this morning, uh, if we're not careful, we're going to miss something with with reading the Beatitudes. If you were just to if you were just read the, the Beatitudes, uh, Matthew five three and five four and five 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 six five seven. Five, if you just start doing that, you're going to miss something. And this morning is truly this morning is truly. Uh, It's going to take me just a second to kind of get there, but I really want to speak into your life this morning. I want to, to, to give you something and show you something according to the Word of God uh, 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 about how you can apply these Beatitudes. And maybe this morning, it's my prayer, 
And I'm not lying when I say this. It is my prayer that this morning you are going to be changed based upon the Holy Spirit in your life and the Jesus Christ, the Lord that we serve. You're going to walk out of here different today than it was that when we walked in here this morning. The Beatitudes, uh, I want you to understand something. I'm going to take just a little bit of time to, to share something with you. The Beatitudes, as you look at each Beatitude, the Beatitudes is broken down into two parts. There's a pronouncement of blessing, and then there's a reason for the blessing. And something kind of unique happens this morning as we read. If we were to read verse 6, uh, and, and I'm going to do this, and, and then I'm going to have you stand in just a moment. If we were to read verse 6, we would say, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Obviously, that was what uh, we, we dealt with last Sunday. And immediately as you leave verse 6, that last word there of be filled, there's a transition and there's a, there's a shift that Jesus takes going into the next beatitude. If you, if you were to look at the Beatitudes 3, 4, 5, 6, if you'll let me number it that way, if you were to look at them, and as we have, as you well know, as we have unpacked them and looked at them, and I, I've done the very best I could with the help of, if anything has been done good with this scripture, it has been from God and not from me. But as you look at these and study these, you will begin to see, as I numbered them, uh, uh, Beatitude 3, 4, 5, and 6, you will see that the attention there is, uh, is, is, is a beatitude, is a blessing, it's an attitude that is to be in our life as a disciple of Jesus Christ, and it pertains, I'm going to do this very simple, it pertains to the pronouncement and the reason pertain to God. But there's a shift here going in the verse 7. When Jesus starts talking about merciful and mercy, there's a shift. And that shift is, is, is where I want to really drill down this morning with us so that we can walk out of here changed than what we were when we walked in for the better, being convicted and changed by the Holy Spirit. Something happens, and what happens is Jesus leaves. He leaves. Don't, don't, don't mess up or mix my words. Jesus leaves talking about God and he starts pouring into the life of the disciples about their life, not with God, but their life with others. And that's what he's, are y'all okay? That's what he's talking about here. And, 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 and like I said, don't mess up or mix my words because I'm, I'm going to bring it all to you in a package this morning. So this transition comes. Now, before we read verse 7, I want it to make sense to you for you to understand why these statements and why these beatitudes sometimes are so radical of these words that Jesus are saying. If you were to study and if you were to look at at um, at, 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 at all of our military branches, uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, all of the you will find that each military branch has some type, they're, they're, they're going to have a slogan, they're going to have a motto, and when you study each branch, you're going to realize that each military branch of the United States has some core values, or they have some core virtues that is drilled in you, maybe even sometimes pounded in you as somebody uh, that is enlisted or ever has been enlisted in, in these branches. Uh, you're going to find core virtues and values in our military. Uh, you're going to find things such as loyalty, duty, uh, service above self, honor, prestige, integrity. You're going to find strong words like that. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing here. And what I mean by that is... Je is, is I don't want to get ahead of myself. Is Jesus says, he, say, he says things like, we're going to stand just a second. He says things, he, say, he uses a word like merciful. And he uses this word of mercy. And sir, man, that is a radical statement on the side of that mountain. Because there is nowhere under the Roman government, there is nowhere under the Roman rule that you would ever use any type of word that even resemble. You would never shape your mouth to use the word mercy when it comes to the Roman government. The Romans didn't use that word. They had The Roman government had four core values. And it was wisdom, it was just, uh, justice, it was temperance, and it was courage. 
So when, 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 when Jesus uses these words, man, it grabs the attention. Do not forget His call is sitting there before Him. Do not forget that the crowd has come up on that mountain to hear. Matter of fact, Scripture tells us, that and this is, this is my translation, Scripture tells us that some of the people that were wild, some of the people that were amazed at the sayings of Jesus on the side of the Mount of Beatitudes was not the called, but it was in fact the crowd that was amazed at His words. So for Jesus to use to, 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 to you hear Jesus say the word like mercy and merciful, man, this is a radical statement with everything that is going on around them. They are literally polar opposites of one another, of the world. And now what Jesus is, does this make sense? Of what Jesus is teaching His disciples and pouring, in, pouring into them with this sermon. We need to understand this morning before we go a step further of what God's mercy is. We need to understand this morning of what God's grace is. And you know this, you can say it frontwards and backwards. And it's a simple fact that God's mercy is mercy is, is, is not getting what we deserve. That is mercy. It is not getting what we deserve. Newsflash. We deserve hell this morning, Pastor Charlie, don't we? We deserve hell this morning. But because of Jesus Christ and us placing our faith in Him, we get God's grace. And God's grace is getting what we do not deserve. There's not a soul in here, including the one that is standing before you right now. There's not a soul in here that deserves heaven. But we're getting heaven because of Jesus. And we got to place our faith in Him to get heaven. Would you please stand, if you don't mind, in reverence to the reading of God's Word. And we're just going to look at verse 7, obviously. As we unpack this uh, blessed beatitude, the attitudes that are to be in our life. And in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, Jesus said on the side of that mountain, He said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Pastor Charlie, would you ask for God's blessings on this service? Yes. Explanation of your word. Father, may we take the meaning that is shared with us this morning. And apply it to our faith. Allow it to change our lives and to what you would have us to do. As Jacob, we want him, we want the Holy Spirit, as you do, in a mighty way in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated, smiling at someone on the way down. I want us to look at this verse this morning when Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. I want us to look at two major truths out of this statement this morning. And the first one that I want us to look at is the simple fact that mercy is given to us. Mercy is given to us. This is a passage of Scripture that is often, I'm not going to say misquoted, but is a passage of Scripture that is misunderstood. And let me, let me explain that just a little bit. In other words, when you first read this and when you first look at it, it says, uh, Jesus says, but now don't get mad at me and just, I want you to get this. So I want it to be clear when we, if, if we understand what's going on, if we understand what's being said, then it's easier to apply it to our life, right? Jesus said, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Daddy, at first glance of this passage of scripture, what is going to appear is, for the, is the simple fact that if I extend mercy, mercy to Rhonda and boy do I if I extend mercy I'm just kidding if I extend mercy to Rhonda that means that I'm going to get mercy returned back to me now that's usually where we'll kind of hang out and at first glance Miss Faye that's how we'll read it and that's what we understand but I want to slow down with us this morning and let us understand something to get the fullness of this scripture is that mercy does not start with us mercy starts with God God is the source of that mercy uh, uh, every now and then uh, I, I, I'm going to ask you a question why did God send Jesus? We'll, we'll say to save us. That's absolutely correct. But the question, if we drill it down a little bit deeper, why did God send Jesus? And we'll immediately go that God sent Jesus because everybody knows John 3.16, that God sent Jesus because God loved 
For God so loved. And that's why we'll hang out there. But, but when you, to unpack the scripture and to do it justice so we can apply it to our life. Tit uh, 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 Paul said in Titus 3, 5, listen to this. Because when you get this, you re, it, re, I, I like to think when you get this, that verse exposed on the page. In Titus 3, 5, the Bible says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Whose mercy? God's mercy. Who's the source of the mercy that we that is extended to us? God is the source of that. Now watch this. Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So Mr. Gene, at the moment of my salvation, God forgave me and God forgot all my sins. See, a Baptist ought to shout louder than that, but with all what y'all have done. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I mean, not only did he forgive, but he forgot everything. And remember that statement, because I'm going to come back to it in just a little bit. Matter of fact, uh, 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 for his, uh, to his mercy, he's, I'm, I'm already at the end of my sermon. I want to get there. Something I got to tell you. Uh, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of the regener of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ bathed me from my head down to my toes, and he cleansed me, and he took all of my sins. He cleaned me, he cleared me, and he chunked. All of my sins into the sea of forgiveness. Yesterday, Ron and I was having a little bit of worship service in the house. Let me tell you something. If you don't worship with your wife, you better start worshiping with your wife. Worship with your spouse. We were sitting right there at my desk at home, and we were having a, our own little worship service. We was listening to music. We was listening to sing, some things people were saying, and we were just digging it. And one of the songs, I, I was asking her a question about it because of this sermon, and she said, that's the McCamies, and that's the song, and, uh, and, and I forgot the name of the song, but the, passage, the, 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 the lyric of the song, um, uh, How Deep Is the Sea, uh, my mind, I, I might sing it for you. I'm just kidding. Uh, she says, Miss Connie sings, My mind can hardly fathom this world's vast dimensions. Time and space have always marveled me. So I could not start to guess how far the east is from the west. But that's how far my sins have been cast away from me. How deep is the sea where my sins have been forgiven? Hey, He's extended mercy to us. And we, because of that, we should extend mercy to others. And that's what this parable is about. Mercy has been given to us. The second major truth is we transition into that is mercy is to be given by us. I'll never forget Mr. Vernon Ward. Some of you may remember Mr. Vernon, but he worked at the funeral home for years. And Ron and I hadn't been married long. And uh, I needed to do some pressure washing. Uh, I needed to pressure wash my house. And Mr. Vernon heard me say it, and, and, and uh, don't, don't take this wrong, we didn't have money buying a pressure washer. I said, Mr. Vernon, I'd love to borrow your pressure washer. Mr. Vernon was an amputee. He only had one leg. And he, he had a little red and burgundy little Chevy S10 truck. And, and I'll never forget that next morning, Chris, he had loaded that pressure washer in his truck with one leg and brought it to me to put it in mine so I could carry it to the house and pressure wash my house. I don't know if it was that evening or maybe the next evening, but Mr. Charlie, I pressure washed our, our, our home. And, and that night I took his pressure washer, and I hate, bar I hate barring people's stuff. Are y'all okay? I hate... Because if I borrow it, it'll break. <laughs> but I, I borrowed his, might as well say I borrowed his pressure washer. And that night I, I put, I should have put it in my bedroom, but I didn't. I put it in the barn. And that night, that pressure washer and a lot of the other stuff I had got stolen. That night. And that ride to that funeral home that next morning was something, a conversation that I was dreading. I remember, 
Because I was so ashamed, I was so embarrassed that his pressure washer had been stolen. And I knew he was going to be mad. And the other thing was, we didn't have the money to replace that pressure washer. Because if we'd have had the money to replace it, we'd have had the money to buy one, and we wouldn't need to borrow one. And I went in his office. I said, Mr. Vernon. And I told him. Mr. Vernon said, son, don't worry about it. Things happen. Okay. I said, Mr. Vernon, I don't know. I don't know when I'll be able to buy you a new pressure washer. He said, you're not going to buy me a new pressure washer. He said, when I need one again, I'll go buy one. I said, Mr. Vernon, I've got to buy this pressure washer for you. He said, no, you don't. I said, Mr. Vernon, I don't understand. And he looked at me and said, and I, he's gone on to be with the Lord now. And I'll never forget what he looked at me and said across from his desk. He says, one day, you will. We may not understand God's mercy. But one day, we will. And that statement changed how I deal with people. Because mercy has, was extended to me. Can I get a witness in the house of God? We are to extend it to others. Luke records in chapter 11 that Jesus was praying and His disciples heard Him pray, watched Him pray, and saw Him when He finished. And it was after that prayer that one of the disciples went up to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us how to pray like John's disciples. And Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this. Now, Luke doesn't record this, but Matthew chapter 26 does. Matthew chapter 6 does. 26 is where I'm going that I can't wait to get to. Jesus says, what everybody calls... Now stay with me. Jesus says what everybody calls the Lord's Prayer. I think it's the model prayer. There is a Lord's Prayer and it's not this one. But that's what we call it and I'm okay with that. I'm cool with that. But it's the model prayer. Now listen. Right after Jesus gives them the Lord's Prayer, He attaches an appendix to it. And He says... I mean, it goes like this, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And immediately Jesus says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Jesus is not teaching here that we're forgiven. Because we forgive. He is teaching us here that we extend mercy because mercy has been extended to us. And if we have truly... Well, I might be getting ready to get in trouble. If we have truly experienced the Lord's forgiveness, we should be found ready to always forgive other people. Three people said amen. It's not, we don't extend mercy. Jason, why did you share this passage of Scripture about the prayer? Look, we don't extend mercy because we're a prayer. It's not about the praying. The, the, the reason we're able to pray has everything and that is heard by God. The reason that we're able to pray and the prayer is heard is because of sonship. The relationship between God the Father and God the Son and our relationship with the Lord. Extending mercy has nothing to do with the sonship, but it has everything to do with the fellowship with the Son. Are you okay? So if we're the recipient of God's mercy, shouldn't we be a contributor of God's mercy? 
to other people? I don't care what's been done to you. And I can't help. It doesn't matter what's been done to me. Jesus says we're to extend mercy. And if we don't extend the mercy, then the mercy that we're going to receive has been blocked. There's not going to be a blessing. And what happens? What, mm, what happens when we realize if somebody wrongs you, if somebody says, I don't know if they they call you a goober head. I don't know. But if somebody says something or does something to you and you get, you get as Mr. Dougal said, you get wind in your jaw and you bow your back up and you, 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 you get sideways with them, it, it doesn't matter. Jesus said, extend mercy. And when you're able to do that, and when you do that, you realize it didn't come from you after all. Because it's on a level that is above me. It's on a level that's above you. And that level goes back to the source and that mercy that you displayed, that you extended because it had been extended to you, has only come from God. And you'll go, wow, I didn't believe I could do that. Well, that's where you're wrong. You didn't. God did it through you. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Proverbs 19.11 Good sense makes one slow to anger. Listen, to you need to write this. You need to put this on your mirror. Put this on a sticky note on your speedometer. Psalm 119, excuse me, Proverbs 19.11 Good sense makes one slow to anger and it is, it is his... Good sense makes one slow to anger and it is His glory to overlook an offense. It's whose glory? It's His glory to overlook an offense. Can I say something? How, how about let's not deal with the big stuff this morning? Why, why don't we just start little this morning? Are you okay? Let's just start little. Has your child ever spilled a drink at the dinner table? And your wrath came down? Have mercy. No pun intended. Have you not ever turned over a drink? Have you never done any of that stuff? I'm not talking about the monumental stuff dealing with mercy. This is what some people call the mundane stuff. Think about it for just a moment. How about extending mercy to that insensitive co-worker that works with you? Just extend mercy. Guess what? You're going to be blessed for it and from it. <laughs> I'm going to get over here and say this one. And I'm not being funny. I'm being funny from walking away from Rhonda. But does your spouse... Again, I'm being serious. I, I think we got to change some things, y'all. Does your spouse get on your nerves? Uh-oh. Why do you say that? Is there demands from your spouse? And we'll, we'll, we'll get mad. We'll get angry. And we'll say things that we can't take back. But she does. And, and you know, I, I mean, come on. Let's extend mercy. Did, it, what about the, the goober on the highway? Extend mercy. What's it going to hurt? What is it literally going to hurt? To extend mercy. I just share with you, it, when we overlook, when we overlook an offense, God gets the glory. <laughs> Think of what could change in our homes, at our work, in our churches, in our county, in our community, in our country, if people just started extending mercy. And maybe it might just need to start here. with you, with me, this morning.
I'm going to close very similar. In Matthew chapter 26, I'm going to say this and I'm closing. And I'm going to try to condense it. In Matthew chapter 26, a lot is getting ready to happen. Jesus, if you're listening, say I am. Jesus is getting ready to be crucified. One could say that Matthew 26 begins the climax of the crucifixion. Matthew and the Holy Spirit does something unique here, Mr. Gene. He takes the story of, 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 of Jesus at Simon's home. I'm going to come back to that. He takes the uh, he, he, uh, Matthew uh, 26, verse 6, he takes the, 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 the dinner invitation of Jesus in Simon's home. There's a, there's 17 people there. You've got Mary, Martha, Lazarus. You've got 12 disciples. You've got Jesus, and you've got Simon. And this is the, this is the passage of Scripture where Mary, who is mentioned three times in the gospel, and all three times she's sitting at the feet of Jesus. <laughs> Can I just say something here? When you find yourself sitting at the feet of Jesus, you can't help but extend mercy. She's sitting at the feet of Jesus. She has anointed his head. She says, not everybody, not all the gospels say head and foot and or feet, but between the, the combination of the gospel, we learn that it was Jesus' head and it was his feet. She takes her hair and she wipes the perfume off his feet. She's anointing his body. It's her ritual for the embalming because he, she knew he didn't he wasn't going to really need embalming because there was something supernatural about this man. That's another sermon. And so they, there's, there's this conversation there. They're just talking about that Mary is wasting. But the fact of the matter is Mary is worshiping. Are you okay? She's worshiping. And Bible study nugget. There's a, direct, there's, a, there's a direct contrast there because you've got Mary with the perfume and her worshiping and you've got Judas with his betrayal in the next verse. And Matthew does that for us. But this is what we do. Watch this. Uh, Matthew, y'all okay? We're going to 1 o'clock. Uh, Matthew 26, verse 6, the Bible says, And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly, fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. Now watch this. If you're listening, say, I am. We, we, we hang out with Mary and the oil. We hang out with Mary... And, and, and Jesus, and she's at his feet, she's anointing him, she's embalming him in her way. We hang out with that. And if we're not careful, all we concentrate on and all we look at there is that Mary has, 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 has poured this expensive flask of perfume on Jesus and she's worshiping. But there's something else in that text that draws our attention. And when Jesus was in Bethany, at the house of Simon the leper. Simon was a leper that Jesus had healed. And they're at his house. He's got salad. He's got baked potato. He's got ribs. He's got steak. He might have even done shawarma for him. I don't know. But now watch this. I said just a second ago that Simon was a man that Jesus healed. How do we know that he was healed? Well, one, the Bible tells us. Two, he had him in his home. If he had still had leprosy, they would not have been in his home. And by the way, when Jesus heals, he heals completely. There's not a flare-up. There, there, there's no flare-up coming back from when Jesus heals. Okay? So the question for the closing and the invitation, don't shut down. Why is he called Simon the leper? If he has been healed, why does the Scripture still point out that he's Simon the leper? He's been healed by Jesus. 
I'll tell you why it's in there. Because that's what we do. Once a leper, always a leper. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Once a drug addict, always a drug addict. Once a zero, always a zero. You an illegitimate child, you'll always be an illegitimate child. You a thief, you're always going to be a thief. You are an unwed mother, you're always going to be an unwed mother. That's what we do. Let me back up. That's what the world does. And sir, ma'am, if we're guilty of that, we've not extended mercy. Let me show you what mercy looks like. Mercy looks like this. All who Jesus will receive, I will receive. All who Jesus will receive, I will receive. All who Jesus accept, I will accept. That's mercy. So this morning, See, the problem is God forgives, but we don't forget. So this morning, this is, this is going to be very brassy for me. Jason, this morning, I will receive all who Jesus will receive but that person Jason this morning I will I will accept all who Jesus accepts except that person can I ask a question is that how is that how you're answering that question do you have a name do you have a person because if you answer that question with a name and with a person, I want you to do me a favor. In just a minute, we're going to stand. And if you have a name and you have a person, I want you to come to this altar. And I want you to ask God this question. God, what sin have I committed that you're still holding against me? And I want you to listen for his answer. Because I'm going to tell you, there's not a one. There's not a one. A mother went to Napoleon who had captured her son. And Napoleon said that this was his second offense and that he demanded justice for his death. And the mother said, I don't ask for justice. I plead for mercy. And Napoleon said he does not deserve mercy. And the mother said, Sir, it would not be mercy if he deserved it. We're here this morning by the grace of God and the mercy of God. And us not being merciful might just be blocking our blessings. How about you? Have you got a name? Come talk to God. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we pause and we thank you for this word. Now, Father God, lead, guide, and direct this time of invitation and meditation. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Will you stand? Will you come? Has God spoke to you this morning?
Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Will you come? Wasn't that pretty plain? Amen. God bless.